Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Elitist Geek VR News for Saturday, October 15th, 2016. Let's jump right into VR, guys. Tiny bit of preamble. I've got the first 48 hours with the Sony PlayStation VR video uh, up already by the time you watch this. Um, have a look at that uh, if it was something you were uh, interested in. I think I've covered pretty much everything that I could think of covering. Um, it's a little longer. I've been trying to keep these videos obviously closer to 10 minutes, not the 20 minute mark. Uh, but because there was so much to cover, uh, you know, this one's at around the 21 minute mark. But if you've got questions on things I didn't cover, let me know in the comments of that video and I'll do my best to answer them or if it requires it, do a follow-up video. All right, news-wise, Sarah Downey, she's one of the writers at Upload VR, uh, whose articles I enjoy reading. She had a cool article today and the title is The High-End VR Room of the Future Looks Like This. And she speculated, you know, technology-wise, how the future VR room for us would look in the future. She never, you know, put years to that, but let's say 15 years from now, 20 years from now, right? Let's, yeah, 20, let's make it a generation thing. So she covered some different areas and she says she pieced her vision together based on pitches and demos she's attended the last, you know, few months, last couple of years uh, that were VR related. And she says, forget the room scale debate. Uh, you know, the VR setup with the, of the future is going to move with you. And she said, probably an eight by eight space where the floor itself, your body movements, all of that gets captured and converted within the context of what you're playing. Uh, or some kind of omnidirectional treadmill. Um, I think it's going to be more of the former. I think we're going to get the technology to a point where, you know, the camera devices are going to be able to look at your body movements and initiate controls based strictly off of how you're moving, how you're acting, what you're saying. So voice recognition, I think, will feature pretty prominently as well. Um, more so than kind of her vision of that, which was floor that's actually going to rise up and yaw and pitch and roll. Um, sounds cool, but I don't think that's very practical and I can't see that, uh, certainly not within 20 years. Uh, she also feels it'll be probably a full body suit or just face and hand. Uh, and she kind of really hedged her bets on that prediction <laughs> because... Probably going to be one or the other, um, but I would agree on that one more the latter. I think it's going to get to the point, like I said earlier, where it will be able to, the program will be able to evaluate actions and motions. Maybe a thin glove, facial expressions on your face, uh, those will be the important factors. I don't see, unless it's just strictly for haptic feedback, the full body suit, um, you know, being an area that's really going to be uh, important or meaningful within 20 years, especially technology wise, like who wants to suit up into a full diving suit, like a scuba diving suit, uh, every time they want to play a VR game. It's, it's, the, it's just not that practical for quick and dirty plays. Has the potential to be the most immersive, but not very practical. And then, like I said, her controls, and I agree with her on this, uh, you know, voice, gesture-based. Uh, she threw in the head EEGs to read brain waves, uh, And, of course, the HMD themselves having evolved to simply looking like a pair of glasses. And I agree. I think it's definitely going in that uh, direction. Next news piece, Samsung. Hopefully the last time I have to talk about this, because every time I talk about this damn phone, I get bitter. They have now officially, uh, not they, but the U.S. Department of Transportation has now made it official. They have issued uh, a statement that the Samsung Note 7 is banned, effective as of the writing of their note, today onwards. So even in cargo, whether it's turned off, 
carried with you, put in luggage, doesn't matter, verboten, it is not allowed to go on the plane at all. So their exact statement, just in quick summary, uh, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration and the Federal Aviation Administration today announced it is issuing an emergency order to ban all Samsung Galaxy Note 7 smartphone devices from air transportation in the United States. Individuals who own or possess a Samsung Galaxy Note 7 may not transport the device on their person, in carry-on baggage, or in checked baggage on flights to, from, or within the United States. This prohibition includes all Samsung Galaxy Note 7 devices. Phones can also not be shipped as air cargo. So you can't ship it ahead of time and have it meet you there. So we knew that was coming. I'm surprised, honestly, it took this long. Um, I would have thought they would have erred on the side of caution, the, uh, the FAA, and uh, yeah, announced this weeks ago. But I'm, I think most of us realized that was pretty inevitable given and poor samsung right i mean hey their bed they have to uh you know they have to lie in it and uh deal with the consequences but it is gonna sting them it's gonna hit them hard absolutely next um news piece has to do with simulator sickness and jamie feltham again uh, another author whose work i really like uh, headline of his article, Field in View, Simulator Sickness Plagues VR, but how do you cover it when you don't suffer from it? And that is an issue, and I've mentioned it here before specifically, that I definitely also suffer from. You know, sometimes it doesn't sound like I'm very sympathetic to those of you who have it, and that's that's not the case. It sucks. It absolutely would suck. If I had that Man, that might be the kind of thing that could drive me into despair because I had waited for VR for so long and I'm so passionate about it. So believe me, I get that aspect of it. But, you know, there's things that tie into that. And, well, let me know if this is off base, but he brings up some good points. And one of them that he talks about is seeing a great game like Riggs, right? Sony PlayStation VR game, launch title. We know the devs did a lot to try to, you know, accommodate motion sickness and dispel it and not even make it be a factor. The problem is, is that the triggers for motion sickness are almost as varied as the number of people who have it. Like, there are so many different levels and triggers of it, it's very difficult to write something that is completely, unless you made it turn-based, uh, you know, and nobody wants to play a game that, you know, takes it to that lowest common denominator where it's just not even fun anymore or immersive. And I think those of you who suffer from motion sickness agree with that, right? As much as you personally dislike it, I'm sure you don't want to see VR as a whole impacted by that to that degree. What I like is what one of the comments said. Rather than penalizing the game, because some games have been ranked lower score-wise because of the motion sickness. And I don't think, personally, I don't think that's fair. I don't think you penalize a game because it makes some people more motion sick. Uh, what maybe they could have is a separate rating and I've seen, you know, we've seen this already with, um, you know, the like or the, the comfort level, they call it, right? Moderate, whatever. Maybe be a bit more specific on that. And I don't mean, you know, projectile vomiting is, is number 10 and, uh, you know, the odd dry heave number two on the ranking. I'm not saying that. But maybe be a bit more descriptive in your ranking system on you know, the types of triggers or whatever that somebody could experience playing that game. And I go back to the big one. I know it doesn't sound like the most practical solution. Offer multiple forms of locomotion. Those of us who don't have it, don't penalize us. Let us have our smooth motion. I love smooth motion. If it was up to me, every game would have that as an option, but it's not. And I realize that's not practical, nor is it fair, right? But having the choice would be amazing because then we can play VR, you know, to that awesome fluid level that we wanted to be able to play it at. 
and those of you who suffer at that smooth you know fluid motion level you've got an option that works for you and you can still enjoy the same damn game without the rating system being affected so a good article take a look at it um like i said it's uh, jamie feltham who wrote that and uh yeah let me know what your thoughts on that if you are somebody who suffers from it you know how yeah w what do you feel the responsibility of the dev is next news piece Steam, and I like this one, to get high quality adaptive 360 video streaming service about freaking time. Mentioned this so many times when 360 is pulpy and fish lensy and cheap, it's horrible. It does more harm to VR, I think, than good. <laughs> so, very, very cool. They've, um, or they are going to partner with Pixvana and Akamai to deliver what they call adaptive 360 video streaming. Now, Pixvana has been working on a technology that they claim can deliver 8K to 10K video resolution quality via the same bandwidth as a 1080p stream. And yeah, I did a double take when I read that too. That's a pretty damn bold statement. When they explained it and broke it down a little bit, you know, at least I got to the point where, okay, that's plausible, right? That could be. And they call it FOVAS, F-O-V-A-S, Field of View Adaptive Streaming. And think of the concept similar to foveated rendering, right? Where the area that you're looking at directly, that's the portion that has the higher resolution or, you know, the, the more complex scenery. Everything around that is at a lower quality. That's kind of what their, their uh, FOVAS does, is the best way to describe it. No date provided for when this service will come online, but uh, when it does, I will report it here. And let's just say I'm very excited about that because when you've seen something in 360 that's good quality, it is pretty damn cool. And it's not true VR, I still maintain that but it's something you can enjoy with a VR HMD at varying qualities. And I'd rather have them be at the high end than obviously at the low, like some of that god awful, and I'll mention it again, prawn, uh, that was out there, you know, like five months ago even. All right, and then the maybe final, hopefully final nail in the whole coffin. Again, not coming from my personal opinion. This is coming from Oculus themselves. <laughs> they have a list, and it's basically a four-point bulleted list on what they call, this is their official plan according to Oculus, to support four different rift and touch camera configurations. Very quickly. Number one, one camera in front, and that is for seated standing gamepad experiences. Two cameras in front is for standing front-facing touch experience. Two cameras opposite for standing 360-degree touch experiences. And again, I'm going to throw this in. There would be some occlusion, just like there is with the Vive, Obviously, if you're going too tight to your chest, blocking, you know, yes, you can do it with two cameras, but what they're saying is there's going to be occlusion. That's why they have the fourth, which is three cameras in a triangle layout, and they themselves call this room scale touch experience. What the exact difference is, one day I'll probably check it out. I'll be curious and want to see it for myself. Between three and four is what everybody gets into an uproar about and debates ad nauseum. Again, not the purpose of this, just reporting what they're saying. Those are the four camera configurations that they are officially supporting moving forward. All right, guys, that's it for the news. Uh, check out my PlayStation VR video if you're at all interested in the PlayStation launch and get my uh, thoughts for the first 48 hours of it, which I will update you know, as the weeks and months go by. Cheers, guys, as always, and definitely catch you on the VR flip side.